My name is Scott Lowry, and I am a pastor in the Evangelical Presbyterian Church, and I'm a hospice chaplain. I work uh, with Jeff Sledge, also with Dr. Bell. Dale, Pastor Dale and I have gone back a long time, and a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, uh, Dale and Lori and my wife Rachel and I worked together at uh, First Cumberland in Cleveland, uh, working with the youth together, right about the time that Dale received the call to ministry from the Lord. And from time to time, I've run into Dale at different conferences and so forth. And so it is a, a delight and joy to be with you this morning. I've heard wonderful things about your congregation, about the building, and I count it a privilege to be with you and to bring God's word to you this morning. Would you please turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12? And as you are turning there, I love this passage because it brings so much needed encouragement to me personally. In fact, I use this passage an awful lot in hospice work. I love to share with people the hope of glory, in which we're going to see here in a few moments. But even as I do that, oftentimes there are some misunderstandings about what's in store, and that's why this passage is exceptionally helpful. I learned a lot about encouragement when I was a new third grader at an elementary school. I learned it the hard way by playing kickball one day. I remember distinctly I was the second baseman. And I remember I was a new kid. The ball from the, the batter kicked it up in the air and it came right towards me. It was a really high ball and it was coming right for me. And all the people around me started yelling, you better get this one, you idiot, catch it things of this nature, and all this pressure was building, and the ball hit my chest and bounced off and hit the ground. And, oh, you could imagine all the scorn that I received after that. I learned quickly a little bit of encouragement along the way is what we need. And here we are reminded of the wonderful encouragement of what's in store for all of God's people. Let us hear God's word then. 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted in your struggle against sin. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Amen to this reading of God's holy and precious word. Let us pray. Father, we come before you this morning and we thank you for the gift of your word. Lord, my words, I pray, will be forgotten. They most assuredly will. My name will long be forgotten. But you, O eternal God, have given to us your eternal word that will stand today, tomorrow, and forever and ever. All power, therefore, is in your word. And by your spirit, it work within us. So we ask, Lord, that you would apply unto our hearts and lives your words of truth, that we would go forth as changed individuals, that we would go forth with great hope, anticipating what is in store for what you have for us, Lord God. So please meet us here. Please change us, we do pray. In Jesus' name, amen. As we begin, I would like for you to imagine for a moment that we have a race, a race where there are no spectators, a race where there is no prize at the end, and a race where there is no challenge. What do you have? You have a hike. But that's not what we're called to. We are called to a wonderful race of life, and we are given this morning a grand picture 
of this race that we are called to. Oh, that we not lose sight of this wonderful race that our life is. Sometimes we can get discouraged in life. Sometimes we can quickly get discouraged in life. Sometimes overburdened, overworked. We can become bitter. We can become broken. We can even fake it where we're smiling on the outside and on the inside. We're desperately in need of encouragement. Over the years, many times I have observed people, those close to me, those not so close to me, who have gotten their eyes off the prize and they become focused on the path in front of them. Sometimes they begin to quit running the race. Sometimes they get stuck in that path when their faith becomes stagnant. A pastor that I respect a lot said, halfway Christianity is the most miserable existence of all. Half-hearted Christians know enough about their sin to feel guilty, but they haven't gone far enough with the Savior to become happy. Wholehearted Christianity is happy, and there is no other happiness. Amen, Amen is right. If we are to capture the grand picture that God has for us and to apply into our hearts and lives, we are to see this picture of the great cloud of witnesses. I believe that are, those are biblical people. I believe those are historical people. I believe those are people that we have known personally. But most importantly, in that great cloud of witnesses is the person of Jesus. And Jesus himself is the one that has called us to this race put us on the path of the Christian life, and therefore we are called to look to Him because He is the perfecter, because the, the purpose that He has in our lives is Him, and the prize itself is Him. I want us to consider that first thought. Our perfecter is Him. Our perfecter is not you and I. Jesus is the founder, perfecter, finisher of the faith, and therefore our faith is in Him. It's in His finished work. It is in what He has accomplished for us. Or is it in you? Is your faith in you or one another? Or is our faith in Jesus and what He has done? Sometimes people say, God will never give you more than you can handle. They say that in my line of work an awful lot. And I believe that that is a, a lie from the pit of hell. It's not true. Absolutely, you will, God will allow in your lives things beyond what you can handle. You are not the author, perfecter, finisher of the faith. Jesus is. And he has accomplished for us victory. And he allows sometimes things very difficult in this world that the only place we have to turn is to him. There will be incredible challenges. Jesus was actually quite clear about these things, wasn't he? He promised that there will be challenges in this world, that there will be burdens that we have to bear. But take heart. Because we are surrounded in this race by a great cloud of witnesses who are cheering us on. Most of all, and most importantly, in that cloud is Jesus himself cheering us on. Do you hear his voice this morning? Verse 11 says we are surrounded by so great a cloud. Throughout, if you're familiar with the book of Hebrews, throughout the book of Hebrews, it talks about... Jesus being greater than Moses. Jesus being greater than Melchizedek. It talks about in chapter 11, Noah, Abraham, Samson, Enoch, David, Gideon. It's talking about all those that have gone before. You might have heard the terminology, the, the church triumphant and the church militant will be reunited together one day. The church militant is the church alive. Those on earth, the church triumphant, are those in Christ who have died and gone on before us are that are now therefore in that great cloud of witnesses. We are as believers connected to those before us. 
we are also connected to those that are among us. I sometimes would joke when I pastored a a local church, I'd say, you better get used to this ugly mug because you're going to be seeing it a long time. And it's true that we'll be together in glory with Christ forever and ever and ever. And this day, we can be greatly comforted in knowing that this connection that we have, that this morning there are our loved ones. And don't some names and faces come to mind some that are very dear to us, some that we have lost perhaps even recently, that are in that great cloud of witnesses cheering us on. Oh, that gives us such comfort. I sometimes talk about those those that are grieving excessively. I would say to them, what would your mom or dad say to you if they could speak today? Oh, that sometimes changes their countenance an awful lot. And I think it also should do so for us as we consider who we are, where we're going, what our purpose is in this world. We are indeed surrounded by the great cloud of witnesses, and one day soon we will also be part of that great cloud. So therefore, let us be the cheering section for one another. Instead of tearing one another down, let us mutually encourage one another as we see the day approaching of Christ's return. It is good news, is it not, people of God? We have great things in store for us and much to be hopeful about. I pray that you will see this morning afresh and anew who you are in Christ Jesus. That Christ Jesus has taken hold of you and is calling us forth that one day we will be in that great cloud. Verse 2 tells us that we do so looking to Jesus, the founder, perfecter of our faith. He is the founder of our faith, not the founder of some hopeless religion, some religion based on our own merit where we have to try to clean ourselves up or try to beat ourselves up enough to prove our love for God. No, we serve a God who himself is the perfect Savior, who himself did give his only Son that we might have life. So our faith then is not just in general. Our faith is in a person, is it not? Our faith is in the person of Jesus Christ who himself accomplished what we could never accomplished in being the perfect sacrifice. Are you the perfecter of your faith? No. Only, only Jesus. And therefore, in all things, we look unto him. You know, Jesus did make it clear what the standard was for us to go to heaven. He said, be you perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And I don't know about you, but I am far from perfect. My wife could tell you we had a fight on the way to church today. It's all good. I'm not perfect. Far from it. Far, far from it. But Jesus provided another way. That through hope and faith in Jesus, what he has done for us, that he being the perfect sacrifice did offer up himself, that through him we would have life today, life evermore. This, not through ourselves, but through the finished work of Jesus. Who for the joy that was set before him, verse 2 tells us, endured the cross, despising the shame. He endured for his people. He has already won the race. And he is calling for us to come and be with him. He has taken our shame. He has taken our sin. He is risen in glory. And he gives to us not only life, but perfection in Christ. One day, it's coming. He has given to us a relationship with God. He's given to us so much. And he did so by despising the shame of the cross on our behalf. And he tells us, come and follow me. He therefore boldly calls us every step of the way 
to come freshly every day to take up that cross and follow Him wherever He would lead. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 12, it tells us, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ has made me His own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on to the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And Doesn't Paul rightly remind us that we are indeed on that path? We are not perfect, but we long for and look to a day that we will be cleansed completely, that we will be with the Lord forever and ever, that our sin will be gone, that our temptation will be no more, and that we will be with the one who did give himself for us, that we would have life and life everlasting. We therefore press on as victors in Christ. We don't have time to waste anymore, do we? We're called, therefore, to encourage one another to remind each other of the victory that we have in Christ. It's not fully realized. Your brother, sister, your neighbor sitting right next to you might really drive you nuts at times. But that's not what we're called to be focused on, is it? We're called to be focused. I see some husbands and wives looking at each other in that. We're called to be focused on what he has accomplished for us. So be kind to one another. I've been a pastor in the local church for 20 years. I've seen people be ruthless with one another. And I've seen people ruthless with their pastors, elders, and deacons. And there is no place for that among God's people. We get some amens on that one. I told Dale I was going to come and support him while he was gone. And I mean it. I mean it. I I tell you, the people of God can be sometimes brutal. Sometimes there are goats among the sheep, are there not? So we need to be on guard to encourage one another all the more every day as we see that day approaching. So Jesus is our perfecter. And therefore, because he is our perfecter, our purpose now is also in him. He is the ultimate. Hebrews, that's the whole point of it, is is that Jesus is far greater than all those that have gone before. He, there, there are many people specifically in chapter 11 that, that are revered by the people of God. And we're reminded that Jesus, well, first of all, there, there are forerunners that have gone on before us in the faith. And that Jesus is the one that accomplished for all those in the Old Testament and all of us in modern times and all those in the New Testament times that through him, We have been bought with a price. There's wonderful people up in heaven. It will be be wonderful to be reunited with them. But they're not the point. They're not our purpose. My purpose is not to live up to my dad's expectations. My purpose is connected deeply in the person of Jesus. Jesus. And now, therefore, all of us, because of what he has done, he has bought us and brought us into the family of God, and therefore, our purpose in all things is him. We see it in three ways. One, this is how we do it in three ways. First of all, we look to Jesus. Let us run, it says at the end of one, that race that's set before us, looking to him. People set their eyes on all kinds of things today. You can go home and find out about the latest signings in the NBA and who's going to be the savior of the Knicks. There probably won't be one. But if you're following, people are looking seriously. I'm not even joking about such things. That People are hoping that the present president or the next president or whomever is going to be our savior. They're looking to many things to be their purpose. And we don't find our purpose in that, we don't even find our purpose in being Americans. We find our purpose in the greatest kingdom of all, the kingdom of God. And the wonderful thing is, as we look under him, we share in the prize of knowing him now. In all things, we are to look to him, 
Many others are looking to all kinds of other things. And sometimes we can get distracted with our theology, our books even, our music, looking to other leaders, whatever it would be. But our purpose will never be found in those things. Our purpose only is found to him, in him, and so therefore we are to look to him, the one who is the perfecter and founder of our faith, who for joy that was set before him, he endured that cross, despising its shame, and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. With joy he endured. When my kids drive me nuts, I have two of six of them here today. When they drive me nuts, I am not slow to anger. I'm very quick to anger. But the Bible tells us over and over again that in his character, he is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. We are with joy to be reminded of the fact that God, who the Bible tells us we were once enemies of God and that he did give us his son that we would have life forevermore. We were not deserving. We will never be deserving. And so, with joy, he did give himself for you and I, despising the shame of the cross, giving up willingly his life. Perhaps was embarrassing, humiliating, and he did so on our behalf. But now, he's not despised any longer among the witnesses there. He stands victorious. Excuse me, I should correct myself. He's seated on the throne and is victorious. Therefore, we are to, not only to look to him, but to throw off everything that encumbers us and run towards him. The race that we're on is not some shortcut to heaven. It calls us daily to take up our cross. It could almost, you could translate it this way. He calls us to daily pick up our electric chair and follow him. Daily pick up that symbol of death and put to death that sinful flesh, the sin that encumbers us, and let us run with fervor after the person of Jesus, that we might know him more throwing off anything that slows us down, anything that entangles us for the sake of knowing him. What is hindering your walk with Christ? What needs to be removed? What sin, what worry, what fear, what guilt, what's slowing you down? Let us throw it off. We don't have time to spare. Our time here is so short And we are to do so, not just because we're trying to get there quicker. It says, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. We must let go of the things that hold us back as we strive forward in the race that we have been called. And as we do that, as we're straining for him, as we're leaving behind, as we're running towards him, we are to follow the course that Christ has for us. This is a specific thing. It is not a vague thing. There's a lot of lies out there that tell us that to follow after Christ means that you will have a new Mercedes Benz. That you will not be sick if you are really, really faithful. That everything is going to go super smoothly for you and you're going to have a lot of money in your retirement account. It doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't ever talk about that in such ways. We will be blessed Some people think it's we follow Jesus to get the American dream. But to be a Christian is to follow in the path that he walked. To follow in the path of his earthly ministry. What happened? His ministry did lead to death. Following after Christ means following in the path that leads to our death of our sinful self knowing him more, growing in him more. Consider him who did endure from, endured from sinners such hostility against himself, that he endured that separation from the Father, that we could have unity with the Lord. It says a little bit later in chapter uh, 13, verses 12 through 14, 
so also Jesus suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For we have no lasting city, but we seek a city that is to come. And following after Jesus means that we are going to often bear the rebuke, the shame that he bore upon himself, that reproach. It will cost us something. It will cost us something in this culture. You will see it in our day, in, our, in my lifetime perhaps, that in America, if you stand for biblical truth, you will pay a price, quite literally. It's coming. It's here. But no matter, we follow the course that Christ has called for us because knowing Him is far, far greater. When I was... Hiking one day a few years ago, I thought it would be a great idea to go hiking by myself and just enjoy the weather, clear my head. And it was just going to be about a couple mile and a half, two mile hike, nothing really big at all. And it was kind of a warm day. And I thought, it's short, I'll just leave my water in the car, I'll just get it when I get back. And I got lost on this path. And I wound up getting on the six mile hike trail, not even realizing it. And as I was going down that path and I was uh, frustrated with myself, I was also frustrated that the people didn't make a very good uh, path for me with markers, and I was lost. Perhaps today you feel like you are lost. Perhaps there have been a season of Difficulty and discouragement. But the amazing thing that we can always be aware of is the still small voice of the Lord whispering in our ear that he is with us, that he will never leave us, that he will never forsake us. And he has indeed given us a map, a course in which we are to follow. Then that, that course is found in knowing the person of Jesus and following after him, whatever cost, whatever, wherever it will lead us, we will follow after him. Because, the, well, we'll get to it in a second, our prize is, is him. I feel like I was lied to growing up. And, and what I mean by that is I felt like I was told, you will have two and a half children You'll have a big house, you'll have plenty of money, and God's going to help you with every little thing that you need. Oh, did growing up bring me to a rude awakening? I got way more than two and a half kids, and six is too many. But you know what I'm, I'm saying? That American dream that we're told that if we follow in righteousness and goodness, that all of these things will come to fruition and that is not what our purpose is in this world necessarily. God isn't here to just make us happy. He's trying to make us to look like Jesus. And the course he will take us through different places and different situations will be to shape us, to change us, and to conform us into the image of Christ. Make no mistake. Jesus has set the course for you, and it's not down a path of earthly prosperity. And by the way, those are also lies from the pit of hell. Our purpose is found in knowing him and knowing him more, because our prize is him. We have a forerunner who has already won this glorious race for us. Did you hear about the guy in the news, the marathon runner, the doctor? And he hopped on the course right at the end and ran and won. And he got caught, and a few days later, he's, he, he died. I don't know if he killed himself, or I don't think anybody knows yet. But cheating ain't going to get you there. We have a glorious person of Jesus who did victoriously win that race for us that we could never have accomplished on our own. And because he has already won the race for us, there is no striving that needs to be done. We run the race, therefore, because Jesus has already won it for us. We run that race because he has called us to it. And herein is a lot of confusion that I come across. When I visit with people, and I'm talking about often their limited time on earth and what's in store, particularly of those that profess the name of Jesus, and they talk about 
yeah, going to heaven, I'll see Jesus, and, and, I'll, uh, and I'll see all my loved ones, and I'll, you know, who's, will I see my, my spouse there? Will I see my parents there? Will they know me? Questions of this nature. And those are all important questions to a certain degree. But the most important thing, the most important aspect of going into glory is not being reunited with the people that we've loved in this world. It will be beholding Christ in all of his glory. Our prize, therefore, clearly is in him and all that he has accomplished for us. It is when we see him in all of his glory, the Bible says in Revelation that he will wipe every tear from our eyes when we see him face to face. There are tears in our eyes up until the moment we go to glory. Am I right? Sorrows and discouragements, sadness. The Bible says, blessed are those that die in the Lord. But it's not a blessing for those that are left behind, is it? It's a blessing for them that know Christ, that are on to, go, on to be with Him. Our prize is heaven. Our prize is being with Him forever and ever. Our prize that awaits us is comfort. So many other benefits, the last of which will probably be, be streets of gold in your own nice little mansion there. The prize, ultimately, more than all of that, is being with him forever and ever. And now it is important for us today to see that he is that prize for all his people, now and forevermore. Jesus is that prize for many people. In that great cloud of witnesses, I think it's primarily focused on chapter 11, Abel, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac. It also talks about in the great cloud of witnesses, the people of faith that crossed over the, through the Red Sea. There are many, many people that are in that great cloud of witnesses. And we're reminded that many have come before us. Many around us have set the standard, have they not, of what it means to be faithful There are many others that are running the race that are non-Presbyterians. Did you know that? Oh, you thought, okay. Well, I might need to stay here a little bit longer then. The kingdom of God is so grand. There is also only one denomination, the church of Jesus Christ. And we have in store all the people of God from every tribe, Every continent, every country, every people group, there are the upward call of Christ Jesus that God will call many, many people from around the world into glory. And that should bring us great comfort. That should bring us great encouragement to know. You know, I, I meet a lot of people that are, that are Baptists, have all kinds of views of baptism, and those things don't really matter very much when you're about to go to glory. When you're about to meet your maker, am I right? I mean, they matter, don't get me wrong, but they don't matter in the grand scheme of things that much. And there are many people that we will be with in glory, and Jesus is the prize, in other words, not just for Cumberland Presbyterians or just Presbyterians. He is the prize for all those who have been born again and know the person of Jesus. But we are called in the context of the local church, reminding each other, encouraging one another, also making sure that we have that, that voice reminding us that we're not the only ones. There are many others, perhaps just down the road one way or the other, many faithful believers. I'm, I should tell you just about me. I'm, uh, my mom's a Pentecostal who married a Presbyterian, so I'm what happens when you cross the two. I, I'm not sure what I am sometimes, but it doesn't really matter, does it? I know faithful Presbyterians. I know faithful uh, Pentecostals that love the Lord Jesus and there are many who will receive the prize of Jesus and the wonderful aspect of this is that Jesus is the prize not just one day but the prize of Jesus is to be experienced today he has won that race for us he is that prize and we are called yes to think about heaven but not only heaven we are to think about what is in store for us, yes, one day, but that Jesus will be with us every step of the way. 
we experience then the prize of walking and knowing him today. Putting to flesh, our flesh to death because he desires us. Consider him who endured from sinners this hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Remember him. Remember all that he has done. And remember that in his struggle against sin, unlike us, he is not resist, we, uh, you have not resisted to the point of shedding your own blood. We are called to experience his love today, his presence in our lives, his leading in our lives the fact that he has accomplished for us what we could never accomplish for ourselves. The victory is done in him, and we can celebrate that in walking with him today. He is our prize now, but he is also our prize forevermore. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the author and perfecter. He is the eternal God who created us. He is the one who has been there throughout our days. He is the only one who knows every single hair on your head. There has not been one that has fallen off that he was not aware of it. There are, he is the one that's been there throughout all of our days, even being knitted together in our mother's wombs. And he will be our joy and our crown forever. And ever. So let us keep our eyes, to fix our eyes on that prize. When my grandmother passed away, and perhaps this was in some ways preparing me for the season of ministry as a hospice chaplain, faithful woman, a sweet lady, she talked about when she got that diagnosis of liver cancer about going on to see many people in that great cloud of witnesses. She was in many ways an evangelist in those last few days of her life, certainly throughout her, her life. And I flew out to go say goodbye to her, knowing that it would be the last time on earth that I saw her. And she talked about going to be with the Lord Jesus as though she were walking down the street to go see a neighbor. And that was obviously cultivated in a lifetime of walking with Christ, experiencing him as her prize today, knowing that very soon her, she was going to experience the prize of being with Christ and beholding him in all of his glory. I want to end today by just saying, you know, as, as a Christian, as being a human, there are profoundly difficult things that happen in this life. There are many things that at some points in my life, I couldn't even talk about them. I can now because I know that he is the one that sustained me. I know he is the one that protected me. I can look back now and see God's leading in so many ways, yet there are so many wounds that I don't understand. There are so many things that are beyond what in this life I could understand and say, Lord, oh, it all makes sense to me now. There are so many things that, that probably will never make sense this side of glory. But I know that only God could get me through. And I know that whatever trial you're facing today, whatever you're going through, God can get you through whatever it is. As you walk with him, as you run that race that he has set before us, in whatever circumstances and in all of life, we are privileged, for Jesus has called us to this race, this path of the Christian life. We are called to look to him because he is our perfecter. We are called to him because he is our purpose. And we are called to him because he is our prize today, tomorrow, and forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, I ask again that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart, and for all of us, all the meditations of our hearts, Lord, would they have been acceptable in your sight? Would you work in us? And may your words continue to resonate in all of our hearts and minds as we go forth this day, knowing that we have been called 
to a race. A race that at times will be tremendously difficult. And oh Lord, what a great promise to know that you have already won that race. What a great promise to know that there is a great cloud of witnesses that are cheering us on, Lord. And more than our loved ones, and more than those that have gone on from biblical times, Lord, you are there cheering us on, praying for us before the Father every step of the way. You never sleep. You never slumber. You are always advocating and interceding for us, Lord. And oh, that wonderful truth that you are the prize for us, the prize for our souls today, tomorrow, and forever and ever. And Lord, if there are any that realize that they have not been on this path, Christian life, that today would be the day of belief and repentance, turning from their sins and turning unto Christ, the Savior of souls. Lord, all of us, I ask that you would bless us, keep us, encourage us, guide us in all the more as we see the day approaching when either we will meet you in death or your return, Lord Jesus. We eagerly await what you have in store. Thank you, Lord. We do pray these things in your name. Amen.